After a quarter of a century, Blue Origin's never been more determined to challenge its arrival. This will mark their first orbital flight and an attempted landing on the very first try. However, reality shows that this goal is far from easy as the company recently delayed the first launch of New Glenn again. Did something weird happen here? More importantly, how will Blue Origin execute the recovery of the first stage of New Glenn? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech, and as always, checking out the episode. The fierce competition between two giants in space is heating up like never before. Just as SpaceX confirmed the launch date for Starship Flight 7 January 13th, Blue Origin initially set to roll January 10th, delayed to January 12th. According to Blue Origin, the delay was due to rough seas in the Atlantic, where the company plans to land the booster rocket. And that's a reasonable justification for the postponement, but the proximity of the launch date to SpaceX's schedule also seems kind of intentional. Imagine, after years of competing with SpaceX, this marks the first time Jeff Bezos might truly respond to Elon with his company's first orbital rocket. Whether successful or not, the trend indicates that Blue Origin's highly confident in the capabilities of its new Glenn for both launching and landing. Blue Origin's thoroughly prepared for this effort, something even SpaceX had to endure multiple failures to achieve. The unmanned ship Jacqueline, similar to the vessels that SpaceX uses to recover Falcon rockets, has already set sail to the designated landing site for New Glenn. So, how exactly will New Glenn execute this landing maneuver? First, located at the top of the booster are aerodynamic control surfaces, specifically four forward fins. These actuated fins are used to adjust altitude during the ascent and landing of the first stage. At the base of the booster are two wing-like surfaces. These strikes provide lift and cross-range capability for the reusable first stage as it comes back to Earth. Ideally, after separating from the second stage, the first stage booster reorients itself to re-enter the atmosphere tail first. Through a combination of aerodynamic surfaces and engine thrust maneuvers, the booster executes a precise landing on a sea-based platform in the Atlantic Ocean. To accomplish this landing, the booster engines must decelerate the rocket significantly. Equipped with seven reusable and throttable BE-4s, the first stage generates 17,100 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level. The BE-4s were designed from the outset as a medium-performance version of a high-performance architecture, and this was an intentional choice to minimize development risks while meeting performance, schedule, and reusability requirements. Blue Origin's overarching goal is to reuse this booster at least 25 times, meaning the engines must also be capable of multiple launches and limited servicing time between missions. Delving deeper into the booster, the reusable stage of New Glenn is 57.5 meters long with the barrel diameter of 7 meters. There are three engines, aft, mid, and forward. Half module houses seven BE-4s. The restartable engine provides precise thrust vector control and continuous deep throttling capability to support thrust reduction and landing maneuvers with a long design lifespan. An 8.5 diameter engine skirt protects the engines from atmospheric re-entry conditions and houses six retractable landing legs. The mid-module contains the fuel tanks for LNG and LOX. These aluminum orthogrid tanks are designed to withstand high G-forces experienced during re-entry. Large aerodynamic fins at the aft end of the tanks enhance the cross-range capability of the first stage during descent and re-entry. The forward module features four actuated aerodynamic control fins used for attitude control during descent. This section also houses ground umbilical connections for New Glenn and the interstate shroud of the two vacuum-optimized BE-3Us on the second stage. The forward module also contains guidance and control avionics, including an autonomous flight safety system, a pneumatic stage separation system that provides positive separation capability before second stage ignition, ensuring all components work together seamlessly to land the booster safely. As for the upper stage, it has an expendable LOX LH2 stage powered by two gimbaled BE-3Us with a combined thrust of 1060 kN in a vacuum. The upper stage has a 7-meter barrel diameter and shares common avionics with the first stage to reduce recurring costs. The second stage's tank length is 16 meters with an overall length of 23.5 meters, including the two high-expansion ratio BE-3U nozzles. Like the first stage, the second is divided into aft, mid, and forward sections. The aft section primarily contains the two BE-3U engines, a load-bearing cross-beam thrust structure, and tank as equipment for extended operations. With the reaction control system stability system employs triaxial thrusters distributed across 
four positions along the thrust structure. The second stage's aft integrates with the forward section of the first stage and provides one of two umbilical interfaces for the upper stage. The midsection houses all the propellant tanks, including a Ford LH2 tank and an aft LOX tank separated by a common thermal barrier. These tanks are constructed using aluminum orthogrid with welded aluminum domes. A single insulated LH2 feed line runs externally around the LOX tank. It's an intriguing process. However, the company's chances of success are uncertain due to its history of delays. And even if it does succeed, it's not going to be able to surpass their rival, SpaceX. Although founded two years before SpaceX, Blue Origin suffered tons of delays. A successful launch of the orbital rocket New Glenn will finally take the company beyond its current limited business of just taking passengers to the edge of space, setting the stage for a showdown between the two richest men in the world in the escalating private space race. However, Blue Origin's late entry comes as the rocket business enters a new phase, one that's potentially more hostile to Bezos' ambitions compared to when he first wanted to get to orbit years ago. Notably, Bezos' potential breakthrough comes just as his rivals achieved unprecedented political dominance in Washington, D.C. Elon's closeness to the incoming U.S. president has caused unease across the tech sector, with competitors worrying about how his newfound influence might be used against them. For his part, Bezos has struggled to rein in SpaceX politically. For example, after losing a bid to NASA's lunar lander, his company warned that the number of contracts Washington's giving SpaceX risks turning it into a monopoly. Today, any formal questions about SpaceX's growing power seem increasingly unlikely. Elon's influence could also play a key role in shaping space policy during the second Trump administration. This might include giving SpaceX an even more central role in U.S. plans to return to the moon. Plans currently heavily reliant on the SLS rocket, a $30 billion project being led by Boeing. With only one flight so far, SLS exhibits all the hallmarks of a white elephant, the type of government waste that Elon's new efficiency task force aims to eliminate. Meanwhile, thanks to Musk, the economics of the rocket business are relentlessly turning against newcomers like Jeff Bezos. Most obvious challenge comes from SpaceX's combo of the heavy booster and Starship, together forming a colossal rocket capable of delivering 150 tons to orbit, more than three times the capacity of New Glenn. SpaceX has dazzled the industry with dramatic demonstrations of landing boosters back on their launch pads, where they are caught by a pair of giant robotic arms. This is a step towards making Starship the first fully reusable rocket capable of refueling and relaunching within hours of its last flight. Most space analysts predict that this will eventually drive the cost of sending a payload to space below 1000 per kilogram, potentially under 500 bucks, compared to the current lowest price of 6 grand a kilogram advertised by SpaceX even without Starship. SpaceX has been able to reduce costs by increasing launch volume. Just last year, the company launched nearly three rockets a week, accounting for more than half of the orbital launches worldwide, representing a rapid escalation from just 33 launches three years earlier, a frequency level Blue Origin would take years to achieve. Nevertheless, despite the gaps to fill, Bezos' rocket company will not lack customers. The demand for space launches is expected to far outstrip supply for the rest of this decade. For instance, the U.S. military is trying to find a reliable alternative to SpaceX. Plus, the race to build satellites and to compete with SpaceX's Starlink is entering a new phase with Amazon's Project Kuiper coming out as one of the contenders. Even so, many might wonder what's taken Blue Origin this long. The company was founded all the way back in 2000, while contemporaries like SpaceX, founded in 02 and Rocket Lab in 06, have been getting to orbit for years now. Beyond the technical challenges that have been endlessly discussed, delays might partly stem from the company's work culture. When it comes to BO's success, the company needed a Gwyn Shotwell, and instead they had Bob Smith. When Bezos announced his choice, I questioned Smith's suitability. That uncertainty wasn't because I know the man personally, but because he came from Honeywell, a company not known for getting stuff done quickly. Based on his background, Smith just didn't seem to have the mindset necessary to run Blue Origin in the way it needed to be managed. Smith's leadership influenced the company's program and cultures, but not in a way that a space enthusiast hoped. Progress slowed despite ambitious deadlines, which only compounded delays. Worse, Smith reportedly wasn't a good leader. By 2021, even mainstream media was reporting on the challenges Blue Origin faced due to the company's management and notably sluggish pace. As a result, Bezos replaced Smith at the end of 2023 with Dave Limp, 
a more dynamic and agile leader coming from Amazon. Limps work to interject more energy into the company. At least on paper, Blue Origin's plan for a new Glenn's rocket now seemed very ambitious. They are talking about 10 launches in 2025, 24 the next year, he said. Such a rapid ramp-up for a new rocket is unprecedented. For its first New Glenn flight, Blue Origin will not launch a payload at all. Instead, the mission, NG-1, is carrying the Blue Ring Pathfinder, a 45,000-pound payload simulator version of the company's multi-use Blue Ring spacecraft to carry customer payloads. The demonstrator includes a communications array power stations and a flight computer affixed to the secondary payload adapter ring. Pathfinder will validate Blue Ring's communications capabilities from orbit to ground, Blue Origin wrote in a payload overview. The mission will also test its in-space telemetry, tracking and command hardware, and ground-based radiometric tracking that will be used on the future Blue Ring production space vehicle. From launch to landing and mission and Blue Origin's new Glenn debut should last about six hours, the company said. If successful, the mission could count towards one of Blue Origin's certification flights of New Glenn for the Space Force and National Security Space Launch Program. The aerospace battle shows no signs of cooling down as Rocket Lab's small electron rocket is set to gain a medium-class companion, the Neutron, this year. Meanwhile, SpaceX's colossal Starship, currently in the testing phase, is designed to dominate all the competition. There is excitement because the Neutron is significantly larger than Rocket Lab's current Electron. It'll compete to some extent with SpaceX's rockets and greatly improve the company's economics, said Andreas Shepard, an analyst at Cantor Fitzgerald. He noted that Rocket Lab is currently the third most frequent orbital launch company globally behind SpaceX and China. Rocket Lab went public during the peak of the space craze in August 2021 when it merged with a special purpose acquisition company in a deal valued at $4 billion, nearly 200% increase from the $1.4 billion evaluation the company achieved in its last private funding round back in 2018. Despite generating $245 million in revenue in 2023, a far cry from SpaceX, Rocket Lab is still considered a formidable competitor. SpaceX is the largest company in the world, and I think people are hoping Rocket Lab will be the second most successful Rocket Lab founder and CEO Peter Beck told CNBC. As the two companies begin to look more alike, it's no surprise that the valuation gap narrows over time. In the realm of space industrialization, attention often centers on Elon, Bezos, or Richard Branson, the figures credited with pioneering investments in space tourism. The public rarely notices the smaller companies scrambling to build rockets and establish a new economy in LAO, roughly 100 to 1,200 miles above ground. No one knows how this new space race will unfold, but many fervent investors view it as the next chapter in human evolution. Heavy-lift rockets are believed to have the potential to significantly impact space science and even alter the course of human history. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.